I'm going to talk about actor network theory and relational materiality. So um, a few terms that you're going to hear me use are technology, artifact, token, and material object. And these terms might be interchangeable as I go through. So if you hear them, uh, the way that I'm using them is, is similarly throughout. The first uh, issue that I would like to talk about is the maintenance of cultural consistency across time. And uh, this is very important to the concept of relational materiality because it explains why we want to make things material. Um, we want to maintain our culture to outlast us, basically. And in doing um, this uh, embedding of practice into material objects, we can achieve this maintenance of doing things the same way over and over again. So what um, actually happens with actor network theory in this perspective is we are inscribing practices into our technologies. So what that means is that there's always a certain way that you have to do things in order to use, um, for example, even the camera that's um, being used to video this right now. This becomes a routine, and then the routine itself becomes a cultural practice. And it's because of this relationship between the material object and the, um, the cultural practice that we're able to maintain some kind of consistency across, across culture um, in time. So another um, example of this we might think of as eating. Um, we have many different uh, foods that we might eat at different times in human history, uh, but there tends to be some consistency in how we go about eating um, over time. So some of the cultural norms are that we gather together to eat with other people. We tend to have, in, uh, it varies by culture, but te we tend to have certain um, utensils that we use to eat, uh, certain arrangements of the food and so on. And this is really um, something that transcends each uh, generation. It gets passed along. And part of that is the embedding of the, um, the, the cultural practice into the material objects themselves. So we can look throughout our history, um, especially with family history, we have special objects that get passed along that um, often entail um, certain rituals that we would maintain across time. The uh, concept then was described as mattering. Um, and this is <clears throat> using the term matter both as, a, as the material aspect of matter, but also the verb to make something matter. And this term was uh, first used uh, by James Hay in 2001. Um, he used it to describe the, the creation of media to make both material artifact and the symbolic meaning at the same time. So physically making something present, but also at the same time making it um, matter to us in, a, in an emotional sense. Um, and this embeds the regimes of behavior into the material elements of the phenomenon. So in his case, he was concerned with media. Uh, we could look at television and the way that it um, both reproduced spatial arrangements of the kind of campfire storytelling um, around a central um, light-giving object, um, and at the same time changed it because we were then listening to the object itself um, instead of the um, storyteller who would have been in that position previously. So there's some change that accompanies this, but the phenomenological aspect of it um, embeds the uh, behavior into the material itself. So the material object, then the artifact, actually does some work. And it doesn't just sit there as a benign object. Um, it works symbolically to convey us meaning. It gives us uh, a sense of alliance so that we can count on it to help us and to maintain our, uh, um, our sense of uh, togetherness. And it also creates belonging and sameness. 
concepts like what, what belongs with us, what does not, otherness, what, it, what belongs away from us. And it also stabilizes our everyday life with meaning through routinized uh, ritualistic performances. The material objects then make visible the conceptual, the things that we think about. And these are the symbolic categories that we use to organize our world. Um, so even in thinking about the food example, um, we have different genres of food and we have different foods for different times of day. Um, we have accompanying material artifacts that go with each of those, uh, those kinds of symbolic um, categories. And it also provides the appearance of depth to what is otherwise purely aesthetic uh, phenomena and performativity. So instead of it just being people eating, um, the meal becomes a, a, a very recognizable uh, symbolic practice. And in America in particular, we might think about Thanksgiving or a Christmas dinner as a as very symbolic practice that is um, very bound up with the material objects. Um, actor network theory then is a method of mapping how the technologies and artifacts and the material objects participate in our everyday lives. And participate is a key word here because it means that the objects are acting with us. And as I've mentioned before, they're not just sitting there benignly. So early actor network theory discoveries included uh, the um, exposing of this myth of neutrality, that somehow we could be neutral um, in our judgments and our observations, and in particular with science. Um, Beaker and Law um, explained that work takes place in what they called messy networks. Messy networks construct both the products and the subjects. So the process is never actually linear and logical. There's always some kind of interaction going back and forth. And uh, Callan and Latour um, worked on this premise that categorical dualisms are theoretical and not essential. So this kind of idea that, uh, that um, the Cartesian mind-body split, for example, um, they would reject that idea that you can't have one without the other. And in sociology, what that meant was that macro and micro phenomena are not essentially different. They're not, in, they're not separatable. You, they have to be part of the same thing. So whether we look at something from a macro or a micro perspective, it is still the same thing in, in uh, that regard. And so they um, invoked the term translation to describe this. And translation for them produces phenomena through the ongoing work of many actors. Um, this concept then required a different perspective and how do we in how we observe and study this. Um, they outlaid three methodological principles. So for sociology of translation, they suggested that there should be agnostic observation, that um, the uh, person doing the study should not uh, believe that absolutes are possible. Um, there should be no foundation. So what you see happening is what is uh, actually to be reported. Um, also, conflicting viewpoints and arguments should be explained in the same terms to maintain generalized symmetry. Um, this means that you shouldn't change the language that's being used in order to describe the uh, phenomenon. Whatever the participants are saying um, is in itself the description of what's happening. And there's also a principle of free association. We the distinctions between neutral and social phenomena behind, that there is nothing neutral, that everything is social. Um, there's a rejection of a priori categorization that allows actors to define and to associate elements of their world according to their own language. So Callan um, described translation as a process before being a result. And this 
uh, built on the notion of translation to uh, explain that translation projects this deceptive appearance of essential definitions and that the distinctions are actually never so definitive or distinct. So even what I'm saying right now is a translation of actor network theory. It's certainly not my um, body of work. Um, and what I'm doing in this moment is standing as the, the translator of all of this um, effort of other people and other uh, um, actors within the network. He went on to describe that translation is the mechanism by which the social and natural worlds progressively take form. The result is a situation in which certain entities control others. This expresses a path from concept to materiality and then there's a con critical concern that comes up with power because of this um, entity controlling others. And power then in actor network theory is very interesting uh, concept. Um, it's the effect of a performance. So the effect is produced by associating entities together. Uh, this is different than how a lot of others conceptualize power because having power is having the potential to associate entities together. This is uh, possibly referred to as power in potentia. Um, but it's not having an object. And using power is actually having others perform for your benefit. Um, it's not exerting yourself. So um, power in that sense is an aesthetic illusion. And Latour then explained that power moves attention to everyday practices. And the power, these things called power tokens are enacted and passed along. So instead of the idea that power is something that an individual is exerting, power is actually the movement of these tokens through the network. Um, he explained that the force that instigates the movement um, sends it on its way. So that could be, it could originate in another um, mechanical apparatus or with people. But then there's an inertia that means that it will travel freely as long as nothing opposes it. So this is Newton's law, in fact. Um, and that the medium that the token travels through um, is a network of actors that reshape and transform the token as they pass it along. So this is how things change then in material form, but they don't change very often and very fast because these objects um, can be very durable. Power is always the illusion that people get when they are obeyed, and it's a consequence, not an origin. So materiality then is a part of the process. The uh, translation is the performance of relationships constituting that process, and the study of relationships then is what actor network theory is concerned about. Um, allies are recruited in various ways to create the appearance of having strength. One ally will lean on other allies to receive a temporary boost. But there's no opposition, only rearrangement. And there's no equality, so the struggle is constant. Um, other actants don't just fall silent. They continue to struggle to have their voices heard. And the dominating voice then justifies itself as democratic, which is that it enunciates what the network is demanding of it. Um, so we can't try to separate society from that which comprises it and makes it durable because it's all part of the same um, society. There are, no, there are social and there are non-social elements, but society is not what holds us together, it's what is actually held together. In the methodology, society can be made tacit by listing practices, but there's a paradox here because technically it's impossible to list all of the practices. In practice, though, we can actually create a definitive list of the practices we observe. And so society is defined by the practices of actors. Um, Latour explains that the notion of power should be abandoned and attention should be turned to the stuff of which society is made. Actor network theory 
is against essentialisms, and it reveals that arbitrary orderings can be otherwise. Um, in other words, the world doesn't have to be the way that it appears to us. Explanations of network assemblage are prone to Machiavellian and managerial answers, but this approach doesn't translate the experience of being marginal or accounting for um, non-strategic orderings um, or things that are not assimilatable. So that which is taken to be natural form is actually produced in a spatial network. Material culture matters because we make it matter. And it's impossible to separate materiality from culture. Actor network theory's non-hierarchical understandings of everyday life see culture as performance and the effects of performance. So authority makes language appear like it's singular, but this is an illusion. It makes it seem like what I'm saying is the definition. That's just an appearance. The multiplicity of lived experience problematizes the fantasy of singularity, and there's no escaping from here to there, physical to metaphysical. Um, as the networked, we are already everywhere that we can be right now. Audiences then must work for their own escape into or from the entelechy of the text, thus rearranging the network as an act of mattering. In other words, it's up to the listener to take what I have said here and use it for whatever purposes they can arrange. 